Okay, let's start. I welcome everybody in our astrochemistry lecture series. And today's lecture lecturer is Professor Dieter Braun from uh, University of Munich. He is an expert in the origin of light and the correspondent field. So he will speak about the basic of biochemistry. So Dieter, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks very much. Thanks for having you all. Uh, hope you enjoy the day. So uh, this is the first of two lectures. We will go a little bit through the basics uh, today, um, also some chemistry, but also basics of what biological chemistry is all about. And uh, the origin of life fundamentals uh, don't need too much you know, introduction, right? Every child completely understands what the question is about. How do we get there? How could we, you know, you know, start in the water? Or perhaps we actually didn't start in the water. That will be one topic and evolve. Um, so one thing which the field, and you'll see that as we go through the two lectures, is often driven by reflexes of the disciplines. So you know this cartoon, the somebody's looking for something which is actually far away, but since the light is where he is, he rather searches there. So uh, we have to, in this cross-disciplinary field here, often have to work against uh, disciplinary reflexes, perhaps even dogmas. Um, and you, you'll see that, you know, where you come from, you have also your home discipline, you have your expertise, your, the fields itself have some idea how to make it. And what has to work against that? And, and that will be a common topic. So, for example, astrophysics thinks that, you know, the molecules are in space and therefore it's super important that the molecules fall on the Earth and then give life because of that. So from the perspective of astrophysics makes sense. If you crunch the numbers, I would argue it doesn't make sense. But also for chemistry, you know, they get very pure materials, high concentrated materials, just buy it, mix them together and think that's the way to make the molecules. And biology insists on that, how the biological molecules is handled by proteins, that's the way you want to have RNA going, although you need the protein. So, so each of these puzzle pieces directions needs to be integrated. And that is intimidating. Physics, of course, always thinks it can simulate things, <laughs> which in biochemistry or periodic chemistry is not the case, and so on and so forth. So we will have to be careful a bit that we subtract these viewpoints of the disciplines and integrate them and follow the experiments so that we are not falling in the trap. What you can see here that you know you make assumptions and you make logical jumps. So the whole dream, I think, of the field is that you can fill that miracle over here uh, with some experiment and actually show point by point by point that you make it through the experiment. So what is life? Um, let's, I hope you have a chat open. Um, what do you think is necessary for life? I want to activate you a bit. Click in the, uh, into the chat. What do you think is essential part of a living system? I have the chat open. DNA. Okay. Sorry, I start here. DNA could be something. Energy source. Yes. I mean, DNA implies that you have informational molecule, right? What do you need more? Uh, you know, you might say, okay, the energy source will keep that uh, thing together. Things like nitrogen and oxygen. Well, yes, molecules we do need. Uh, okay, that's very... Uh, uh, what else? I mean, yeah, we, we are not... We, we, won't, we won't run computer code earlier uh, on early Earth. Uh, so, yes, we have to get from that, but actually... If you want to go for DNA, it has to be quite more complex. If you want to abstract it a bit, you know, what mechanisms, you know, not all 
of these elements will give you life, some kind of reproduction mechanism. Yes, so if we talk about DNA, and we should actually also mention RNA could be a good contender, that's part of what we talk. We want to have a replication machinery. Why? Because RNA, DNA at some point, you know, breaks down, and we want to keep the information by replicating the information from RNA and DNA. We'll discuss that. Is water needed? Uh, partially, we'll see it's good. Partially, it's bad. So, so actually, it could be you have to have a compromise between that. A metabolic mechanism, that's true, right? I mean, if you want to get to these molecules, you can call that a metabolism. And one should always kind of imply that the molecules must come somewhere there. And best you can do that in the same condition, or you have to make a big stockpile and hope that the stockpile will last until you develop your own metabolism. Uh, lipids, that's something people often say that they want to have cells, you know, that the molecules are inside and outside. Um, I would argue a bit against that because I think, you know, there are plenty of things on early earth which gives you that. And the uh, cell always implies that you need to have very good mechanism to accumulate things. Therefore, I'm not so sure whether that is the first ingredient. At some point, evolution got very much more uh, efficient when it had a cellular compartment could act as evolution on the cellular compartment. Something more? I mean, you want to have it local, right? I mean, uh, what was also written here is compartmentalization. So, so you want to get things together at one point, right? And, and keep it there. Amino acids, proteins. At some point, uh, you want to make proteins out of amino acids and somehow that machinery of the genetic code has to emerge. So that could be a late accident, but who knows? Perhaps we see actually that amino acids are helping, for example, replication mechanism. Well, that's something where still there's some uh, lack in connections. Okay, very good. So uh, those are very good points. Your nucleopase is exactly, I mean, you, for the information molecule to make it together, you want to have it the small parts and get that uh, together. Those are very good points. Uh, I, I just, uh, we'll get back to these, uh, to these points. I have here the NASA working definition of life, self-sustained chemical system, capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. So we have not yet touched the thing of Darwinian evolution, which is kind of replication and selection as an as a important part of the system. Um, this is self-sustained. I mean, so some metabolism-like thing, so it should keep itself. What self means is a good question. You know, is that rather the self of, of the geological system give it together? Um, it will be a chemical system, and Darwin evolution implies information. Okay, so let's see. So when we talk about life, we actually talk about sequences. It's actually quite interesting that the same concepts which people in the 1950s uh, argued for the basic, most fundamental computer, you know, for example, a Turing machine, you know, digital zeros and ones along a long line, uh, is actually... The very much same concept what uh, what life is using and i have here and i i probably shortly stop the share that you see hopefully you can pin uh, my screen a bit better here so so i have here a magnetic model of here dna but rna would be the same so it's quite interesting that the same concept what computer scientists argued that we don't talk about something which is analog but we talk about digital was taken by life. So, and uh, as you all know, double-stranded forms, you know, for DNA or RNA, uh, has the big advantage that while here you have color-coded, you know, the information of bases, here we have black and white bases. So you see here, it's actually a boring sequence, white, 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 and red, uh, black, 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 can be then broken open, you know, uh, and you split it into two halves, and that has a, the great advantage that each of the halves have the information so they can swim around and hopefully find a replication process by which you have a mechanism where matching sequences come to it and actually rebuild the system again. 
So you, you build it again as a double-stranded form and therefore are able to replicate it. And if you do that quite well, you get you know, duplication of the information each time. So if that's really exponential, like the rice corns on the, on the chess board, you are able to really replicate that fast enough that the exponential decay of the molecules, because water actually attacks this molecule, um, can be compensated. So the whole idea is that we could think about that such a molecule could be the basis of replicating um, um, information fast enough that it can overcome the, um, hope you see the screen again, uh, you can overcome uh, the degradation source. So why is that interesting now? It is interesting because you are faced with the machinery um, that DNA and RNA, if you think about this as a 3D printer, actually gave rise to the machinery to encode proteins. So the genetic code is done in RNA. RNA molecules, quite a complex machinery, you get to see that in a second, is able to make proteins. And nowadays, these proteins are able to replicate DNA and RNA. So you have a chicken and egg configuration. And the idea early on, even for the computer scientist was, if we want to make a, a replication machine, we have to think about a kind of a 3D printer, which can print a 3D printer. So you want to make a machine that makes itself. So, and funny enough, all the requirements which computer scientists argued for the replication machinery is also found, or can be argued quite closely, is found when making the genetic code and making proteins out of RNA. So as I told you, the genes, you know, DNA, RNA, they need proteins to replicate themselves. So you split it in two parts, you really replicate it, but with the help of protein machineries. And the protein machineries are made out of such a machinery here where all these compounds are RNA. The core catalytic site over here is also RNA. So RNA is made to make the machinery for proteins, which then make RNA again. But the core interesting thing is that since this is all out of RNA, while you do have a chicken and egg problem to really establish proteins, RNA itself should be at the core and the start of evolution. So life and biology gives you very strong evidence that because this ribosome here is made out of RNA, let's see what we can do with RNA in the first place. So that's um, a motivation to go for the RNA world and you know think how you know you can use these. RNA molecules to make this thing going without the help of the proteins in the first place, and only if things get more complicated, more efficient, more Darwin evolution, you have to go for such a ribosomal machinery. So you can split actually the task away that you would start from very simple compounds of RNA and only later go for proteins. Of course, those proteins have to be around, and if there would be a good link between those two classes of molecules early on, the probability for the whole machinery to evolve would be much higher. What do we talk about timelines? You know, especially when you come from astrophysics, you you know are talking about uh, the Big Bang, title of the lecture, some fourteen billion years ago. And the inflation, and then you you know you had to establish the suns to the to the point that you do get those elements which you need to build the RNA. It is important to understand that, like space is expanding, evolving, you have the sequence space evolving in Darwinian evolution, and the timelines are actually quite comparable. So time is four billion years of life. And uh, you can, you know, see actually you can trace back the history of these different species by tracing back the history of the proteins, and get a quite good uh, uh, structure of the problem. 
The thing is that these are all sequences which are based on proteins. So here, basically, you are faced with the thing again that you have a ribosome at this point, so already quite established um, machinery where you can't go beyond. So extrapolation with biology is quite good as you keep it with proteins, but then you can't go beyond. So what we have to do in the lab actually is do bottom-up experiments to fill the gap from the other side. So to think how can we reach that RNA machinery, which is already quite complex, quite complex sequence of RNA uh, as we go forward in time. So we want to have a um, replication mechanism, selection mechanism, and we want to reconstruct them from lab experiments. Um, again, these are the two stages. So the idea is that you want to first get shorter sequences, which are able to make the proteins at this point. And it could be, you know, that the cell encasing, making these spacecrafts, which you can swim around and get nutrients in and out, which we call bacteria, comes quite later. So it could be the replication mechanism is something you would find on a rocky planet like the Earth ubiquitously or at some specific locations, but quite barely on the surface operating before it evolved the sequences who make, for example, all the import machinery possible to cell division machinery, all the coordination between cell division and replication that you can really go for cells. Okay, so if we want to go for the history of biology, therefore, you know, we had already uh, the one point where if we make a timeline here, um, and we have here this timeline of the ribosome, where, this way, ah, come on, uh, where we start here uh, to have the ribosome. Come on, give me a break here. So, um, and uh, tRNA for the experts, that's the small molecules where which are actually doing the transfer for the genetic code. And you have a start of biology at some point here. Then it is, of course, logical that you want to have amino acids already before, right? So amino acids would be important before. And it's a bit unclear what comes First, amino acids are quite uh, small molecules. You know, this is one amino acid. It's quite, compared to the RNA, uh, quite a simple molecule. And uh, you might have that quite early. You will have RNA, we argued before, because that's useful to get the ribosome together. It is unclear at which point, you know, DNA comes. DNA could be early already it really depends how the chemistry of dna is as easy as the rna or the replication of dna is as easy as rna that's at this point a bit unclear um but basically back here you have dead molecules and they need to organize themselves um and i think it's quite important to early on already consider what the Earth can give you. Uh, I write here rocky environment, since quite a number of experiments indicate that you need dry states. Uh, so yes, you can do everything in water, but you need some air bubbles. If you're really down deep, it might be a bit difficult to get those dry states. Um, and then, as I indicated, I would argue that vesicles and all those molecular made compartments might be a bit later, but happy to discuss those details. So so that it's a rough timeline, but one has to, because biology starts here 
and we can't go beyond all these parts here, basically, that's something to reconstruct by lab experiments. We have to rebuild these to check it. We have no evidence, you know, no fossils, nothing where we can really have hard evidence. So it's all about reconstructing, recapitulating with lab experiments. So how do we become alive? So, so one can imagine different phases of how the aliveness emerged in this in the setang. Uh, one is that you want to establish a molecular steady state. So you want to have a machinery which gives you RNA molecules um, quite reliably, right? You want to have them produce by the environments of the planet. And that's, you know, that's one part where you want to understand that process and also how the recycling operates, how the, you know, how the molecular basis is there. And I would argue here that, that some non-equilibrium would be really important here because you want to accumulate the molecules, you want to, you know, get that steady state because entropy is a very strong force which pulls your molecules apart, things are falling apart, and these molecules are rather complex, complex entities. You know, you don't find them flying around. You actually also don't find them meteorites. You, uh, you, you know, it is just a bit the level of complexity high up where you would just get that. But even meteorites are very instructive because, you know, they give you smaller parts of that molecule and apparently a hydrothermal dynamics can give you that. And the richness of the of the initial pool of molecules is quite is quite good. So we want to think about you know what non equilibrium can give you these molecules reliably so that you can run uh, evolution. The second thing second thing is then as we said already maintaining maintaining molecular evolution. Uh, sorry, molecular information. So, so you want to see how, how the first sequences evolve, right? They need those building blocks, but we also need to have another equilibrium to make a replication machinery out of those building blocks. And here I would say that's, that's the part where you, you're becoming alive, right? Where, where you, you are getting, you keep the informational content, you know, beyond the molecules. So it's not only that you have these molecules, you want to have them at a specific sequence uh, where you, uh, you get it together. And then once you have that living species and you have evolution going, the thing is, of course, remaining alive. And then things happen like competition between species. Things are evolving into the into the specific niches and you have things emerging, uh, you know, such like evolutionary trees. You might actually hear in the beginning have a lot of cross links, a lot of lateral gene transfer, mixture of communities of sequences, but then you get the tree of life uh, basically. And you get a full evolution of function so, for example, and we said that, you know, proteins that replicate RNA or DNA. And we will get to these molecules because we can do very nice experiments with them. But that's kind of, we, we, we take a mechanism from biology and simulate with that mechanism a process of maintaining molecular information actually early on. But of course, we'd love to make this, of course, only running on RNA. That would be the, pair, the point in time, you'd say, that's the RNA world, however you are defining it. So in the beginning, it's rather the physical selection from non-equilibrium conditions which give you those 
molecular mixtures on which you can then have the evolutionary process kickstart. You have sequences, they have a selection advantage. It might be just the advantage that they survive better um, and keep the sequence. It could be already sequences which have some very tiny, tiny local function, but it could also be it's just sequence which have very good click and find and sequences are really compatible. So in experiments, for example, we find that that you get repetitive sequences. So, so <clears throat> the repetitive sequences can bind to each other in many, many ways. So, so it's kind of very recombinatorically uh, active sequence. <clears throat> and then comes the big jump that proteins emerge and then you get into the biological selection of life. It's kind of the selection between life to adapt to better environments. But the adaptation to better environments doesn't mean, you know, then you have more freedom to go for different environments. The search for the origin of life or, um, is actually to find that one environment where the becoming a life was possible. So in another way, think about it is that if you want to get from the soup, whatever molecular mixture you have initially, and you want to get to life, what will enhance itself is sequence, also sequence length, that you get more information, you want to have replication machinery, which keeps ever longer, longer complex sequences. And you want to also see that the complexity is increasing. While you do that, you um, have some entropy reduction. So you have a machinery where initially you have to keep it such that you have a local entropy reduction of your soup. So it's not a simple soup as you would cook it must be a little bit more complex environment. And that's the big question. You now, what local ent uh, entropy reduction you can think about? So from, from then random molecule assemblies, the idea is that there must be, you know, second uh, law of thermodynamics, a dissipation of energy because only by that you can locally reduce the entropy. You can make that information. Otherwise, you always uh, increase the entropy and uh, you will never be able to make complexity in sequence um, structures. You'll get the selection of molecules configurations, you know, that includes that you can get these complex RNA molecules. And then, you know, again, there must be quite some, you know, external driving force of, again, dissipation of energy to get towards self-replication sequences. So if you just put in molecules, uh, you can tell them, hey, folks, please replicate, but they won't do it. Uh, unless you have a dissipation of energy, you are driving the system in an equilibrium out of which it can actually, you know, buy overall increase of entropy, have a local decrease of entropy, and actually keep those complex sequences in there. So that's, for me, the, the, the big question, you know, what environments can you think of? Which environments can you make, which are actually able to drive you towards life? Because if you just keep life in the Eppendorf tube in the lab, let it sit there, it will, of course, go back to the soup. You know, it will disintegrate, fall apart, 
and uh, it will die. <clears throat> so th that entropy aspect of it, well, it's probably my background of physics, stressing that, um, can come in, in three flavors. And I'll want to discuss them um, because people, I think not, not fully separating the idea of how you have uh, the influx of entropy. Why? Because normally in many biochemistry driven approaches, they just say, I do start with a low entropy molecule and that's it. I'm not asking why do I have that low entropy molecule, how it would be recycled, how you get that. You just put everything onto the molecule. That is a, not, not only how a chemist would run things, you know, keep things initial point by buying the molecule from sigma and having it at low entropy because you buy them and then mix them together and let it you know, go downhill actually into equilibrium and do its job because then you can create sequence and replicate sequence because you injected the low entropy state into the molecule. So that's nice because you, you can do nicely experiments, but also that's what the biological guys would tell them to do because here, you know, this molecule is ATP. TP stands for that triphosphate here. It's kind of the energy source of our body. But of course, our body is always recycling these molecules. So in biology, it's easily thought that that's your starting point. You have ATP. And uh, I'm not asking where this comes from. That must be some magic. But that is driving the reaction. Um, so that input uh, argued for for these uh, RNA molecules. And we have to go a little bit now into um, how this RNA molecule is built. So you have a ribose at the core of it. You have base that comes as a G, C, A, and U, if you talk about RNA. So you have four different bases. Um, and then you have this triphosphate. The phosphate, of course, comes becomes important because uh, you'll see that one of those phosphates, so these three, two will be thrown away, but one of the phosphate makes the links to the next base. So RNA is a molecule which is linked by phosphate molecules in the background. So here, why biology works like this and why also this imidazole activation, which is, you know, taking the same thing, but not having the two phosphates here, but the imidazole group. Why is that working? It works as a leaving group. So very simple principle. Again, it's an entropic principle. You go entropy downward uh, uh, towards equilibrium. So you have, if I write this, you know, if this is the base and then you have here your, your molecule, and you want to get the next molecule connected to it. So you kind of have two molecules. If you connect them together, you know, you want to fuse them to make a sequence because that might be G and that might be C. So G and C, you want to have a, a dimer of RNA. The problem is that you transfer that to one molecule. What does it mean? It means the entropy is reduced, right? I mean, each of these are particles like ideal gas. Uh, you calculate the entropy of the ideal gas. It goes downhill because you get less randomness in your sequences. So how can you overcome that? Well, you overcome that because you are creating this leaving group molecule so that one molecule goes away. So you have a leaving group. And therefore, group, come on. Uh, 
And that leaving group means that you then get two molecules as a result, right? So in that sense, um, you can um, keep the entropy balance. And then at the same time, if there's some energy involved in this bond and you open it up, you go down uh, with the energy scale. So by that, you can push the reaction going forward. So that's been uh, the principle for, for many of the experiments uh, doing uh, replication. Uh, basically, uh, ribozymes, so complex RNA molecules operate very often with these ribosomal NTP molecules. Or um, if you just want to replicate by the bases, you often operate with this imidazole. Um, I have not yet touched to the problem, what is kind of the, the difficulty when you do this reaction? Well, the problem is when you have two RNA molecules um, just hanging around with that one phosphate. So if this one has just one phosphate, this has another phosphate, for these molecules to come together to get to that GC, again, GC, GC dimer, you are actually removing a water molecule. This is a common scheme. Also, when you have proteins made out of amino acids, as you make the chain of amino acids, or here the sequence out of RNA, you have to remove a water molecule. Now you can imagine that that's difficult because in any environment, even dry environment, you still have water in a dry crystal. Very often you still have uh, a water molecule in there. And therefore this is very improbable. You know, you rather actually have the opposite that if you add a water molecule, it goes the opposite direction and you are actually breaking up the RNA by inserting a water molecule. It's actually one of the typical ways how you destroy RNA you put in a water molecule and you split it and it breaks apart. Hydrolysis is the technical term for that. And um, again, you can see here that um, uh, because you just have a lot, um, you do that in the background of a lot of water it is actually quite difficult to make this reaction go forward. And it's a polymerization reaction, so you have to have very high yields to make long enough strands of such a reaction. So that actually provided uh, people already in the 70s, but I think you know we revisited that uh, um, also by looking at this backward reaction and look for peculiarity of RNA molecule, uh, what it does, uh, when it um, does that hydrolysis. And I was shortly going to show you that uh, directly with the molecule. So, so that's a base. Uh, so G in this case doesn't matter. I just make it like this that you're not uh, so well seeing that. Um, you have here on this hand side, this ribose uh, molecule. So here one oxygen. I hopefully you can see uh, if you would go back for the slide uh, and this ribose and it has a, a special ending which kind of is a is a longer tail here um, these are numbered so where the right uh, where the uh, bias is sitting you count one two three four five for the uh, for the carbon molecules and it's called prime so so you will actually then say five prime or two prime. That means you are attaching things here on the two prime, for example, and the three prime. So what I have here a molecule is which has on the two prime a phosphate group. So the idea would be now um, that you have a second RNA molecule coming and have with that five prime end attaching itself uh, to this phosphate, okay? And again, it also has a base and so on. And that's the basic building block of that GC dimer. So 
But to do that, I actually have to remove, you know, I don't make this oxygen-oxygen group here. I have to remove one of them. So water has to go away uh, to do that. So, um, and, and you do have water molecule here and so on and so forth. So if you really want to connect it, um, uh, you have to remove one more water molecule. Now, the interesting thing is, and I told you that if this is broken up and it breaks up as an RNA molecule by inserting water, so you make two RNA bases out of one, you actually, normally, if this would be DNA, you would add a water molecule to the, to the molecule. The interesting, very interesting fact for RNA is it doesn't do that with a very high probability. What it does, it makes a very strange thing, which is a cyclic phosphate. So this phosphate group here actually binds between the two prime and the three prime and makes a cyclic phosphate. So it has a kind of a automated recycling mode, which means that it keeps itself dry. So it's not attracting the water molecule from the outside, but because the local concentrations and all the intricacies of the molecule, it can keep itself dry. So in a way, what I showed you with this activation leaving groups, it is not a leaving group what we have here, but it's what's called a ring opening polymerization. And it is activating the molecule by having the water repelled. So that's an interesting intermediate. So when water, when RNA degrades, it's not enriching itself with water, it keeps itself dry. So the, the question was, can we use this cyclic 2,3 prime natural, you know, hydrolysis product as the raw product to start actually the RNA replication? So can we polymerize uh, this molecule? Um, so people studied that in the 70s, figured out you have to go for very high temperatures and it's unclear, you have to go for dry state still, although you, it's already a pre-dried molecule. Um, and it turns out, uh, at least that's what we find in the lab, that they did a little bit mistakes back then because they added many more molecules which they thought would be helpful. And it actually is important that you're not adding much salt you're not adding many other molecules, especially not adding molecules which stabilize the pH. And you have to run this at the pH, which is not seven where biology usually runs, but nine, 10 or 11, um, which is actually dangerous for the RNA because it also wants to hydrolyze again. And the question is, or the finding was then that if you go for these precarious conditions at high pH, uh, you are actually running a, a, a recycling of this molecule. So long story short, um, this special configuration of 2,3 prime cyclic is something which I think is interesting and it's useful to look into it um, quite more detail. So I'll, I want to show you that a bit more in detail. So this is what I uh, uh, want to show you. So if you have this in this open configuration, which is not in this cyclic configuration, as you can see here, if you want to get these together, you have to remove a water molecule to make the RNA. So that is done by this ATP for, or NTPs in biology. Uh, and the interesting thing is, I argue here for a mechanism which operates at the bottom part of the RNA molecules. And here we would operate at the five prime. So this is five prime, uh, two prime, three prime, that we rather operate at these two, three prime parts. So that's what biology operates with NTP. This is this imidazole, other activation group, Jack Shostak group is working a lot on this, also other groups, um, because it's kind of the, the best working uh, polymerizing agent, activation agent. It needs high salt concentration, which actually has the drawback that, uh, especially a little bit higher temperatures, it runs back into that hydrolysis, so it breaks up the RNA, and it stabilizes the double strand very strongly. So it's actually very difficult to make this strand separation uh, mechanism going. It's a bit hard to, you know, the, the question if you go for these leaving groups is that you have to think about how to recycle your molecule. You also have to have metabolism, make the molecule new and so on and so forth. 
and that uh, keeps it difficult. People also use the trick of EDC, which is an industrial way uh, compound to remove water, but uh, people have not managed to get a similar prebiotically more plausible molecule. Uh, so it's a, it's a dirty trick. So people use it and sometimes hide it actually in the paper. Uh, and it's a bit uh, annoying uh, that people are not really honest about it. So what I want to argue here is that while biology rather operates at the five prime end, it would make sense that prebiology would operate on the other side of the molecule with the idea that that is operating, can run its business. It has the other side, the five prime, as an open leaving you know, end to operate some more experiments, which then can actually take over the mechanism. So you rather, you know, run the replication mechanism on one in one direction to run it prebiotically, and you have the opportunity to to make play games on the other side, which then actually take over and take the biology. So what I told you is that if you have an RNA molecule like this, this is one which is nicely linked. So it has the five prime. Uh, linking here to the three prime and so on. If this is opened up by hydrolysis, you are not uh, adding a water molecule because you get this cyclic RNA. DNA can't do that because DNA doesn't have this OH group here. And for DNA, can't go into this mode. So that would be the then the, the solution why RNA would be taken because RNA can keep itself in this pre-dried form and DNA can't. And therefore, what I talk here about the mechanism of replication um, uh, is not possible to run with DNA. On the other hand side, this is exactly the reason why DNA is more stable because it is not running the risk that this OH group you know, actually wants to uh, attack here the phosphate and grabs it and make a cyclic phosphate. Now, the big advantage of the scheme here is that you have a full recycling. So you make the RNA, and once you break it, you break it in a form that you can make it again. And you don't have to reestablish a metabolism which actually makes this imidazole exactly at the same place again, not somewhere else, and not wrong, and you get the same molecule. You just always recycle the same molecule. So that's uh, for, for the chemistry and metabolism would be interesting. And um, so the idea is that you start with such a pre-dried molecule. We can discuss where you get this from. So the whole process is only shuffling around water, kind of, you know, actually not really shuffling around water because you just shuffle the phosphate binding. Um, and this peak age of 9 to 11 is actually also buffered by two of the bases because the bases have a pKa and therefore control the pH. And we started to understand this process better and better and can see how uh, to get this molecule uh, replicating. So the idea is the following. You have these conditions. Uh, we can span this actually over quite large temperature range. It actually is better at lower temperature because when you run this um, polymerization, you still get a lot of this two or three cyclic ends. And we'll get to the point why that is important. We do get about 60% of the right linkage that you have here, the five prime and three prime. We do get also the wrong one. And in the past, again, people thought uh, this reaction is no good because you mostly get this one. Again, that was because you added a lot of other molecules, buffers, all other things where this is indeed the case. Um, and um, all our experiments indicate kind of it's rather 50-50 with a little bit of bias of, of the right one. Um, that can actually uh, self um, correct itself because the hydrolysis of this to five prime is much faster. And therefore the recycling, if you run the recycling mode will purify itself to the right one. So how do we, uh, know this? Well, you do um, analyze these linkages by NMR. Um, you can then look for the hydrolysis. Again, the hydrolysis will go back to that cyclic state and it will restart its 
uh, cycle. So this goes in the wet dry cycle. So the, this reaction up here is a, the dry reaction. And the hydrolysis, of course, rather operates at the wet state. And we'll get to know why we need the wet state. Well, that has to do with the double strand form of the replication down the road. You do also have about 20% hydrolysis where actually it breaks up. And then you need something to, uh, re uh, to recycle it in the real form. You know, you make the recycle of the phosphate back again. And one thing we like uh, using it as a trimetaphosphate, why? Well, if you have a lot of phosphate lying around, if it's probably coming from uh, special volcanoes, if you heat this up, you get with a very high yield, such a triphosphate form, ring-shaped uh, triphosphate, which is a nice way of actually activating these molecules and making it. So you start from a pre-dried ring phosphate from volcanic process, which actually then is recycling these phosphates back then. So that will be the idea that you get a very a very simple uh, um, polymerization. So I'm not yet talking about replication. I'm just talking about how to make RNA molecules, how you make these sequences. You know, that could be G, C, whatever, A. How do we know that? How we analyze it? Well, uh, we use a special HPLC, high pressure uh, liquid chromatography column. Uh, which gives us peaks for tumor three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And each of these times are then injected in the mass spec. The mass spec gives you counts. Uh, and this is mass over charge. And then you get these peaks and you do know how the isotope contribution should look like and you fit it and you can see overlaps. You can actually analyze sequences and really get the idea. So that's the basic um, machinery to, to run this experiment. You dry it for 24 hours um, under these conditions and have a look at the mass spec. So I told you that we want to have a lot of these two, three cyclic. And we do that, you know, either we get them via hydrolysis. Uh, we also get them if we rather go at lower temperatures, four degrees, 15 degrees, 20 degrees, uh, and not too extreme pH. If pH is 11. It has the tendency that it, um, it actually breaks open the cyclic. Okay, so what is now interesting, and that paper just came out, um, is that if we come back um, to that double-stranded form of RNA, and we do have a long-strand BA, which we actually want to replicate, and we have longer strands here, and imagine you have all different of those uh, sequences, but of course only at least if you go for six to eight mers at room temperature, preferably only the correct sequence will bind there. Um, and if that has actually a cyclic phosphate, again, a two, three prime cyclic, which is indicated here, we actually could observe at the same high pH conditions, almost no magnesium. So we don't have to go for that dangerous magnesium, a little bit salt that the double stranded are forming at low concentrations, micromolar, and give it a waiting time of about seven days, we see that the ligation product is coming up here. Same time, we are losing actually the cyclic phosphate. So we are getting these inactivated primers where things are opened up. <coughs> it seems that the reaction is sitting there trying to make the replication by ligating the right sequences, but with about 60% chances it doesn't do it. 40% chances does it. This is a function of pH. Very good things is at pH 10, <laughs> 5 to 10 degrees. Now, the interesting thing is here that if we change the last base, and I'll probably shortly show you a bit what this actually means. <clears throat> so, again, we have our Single strand, we want to replicate. Okay, so we want to have, here we have a sequence of black, 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 white, white, white. Okay, so what the pool of sequences is giving us are short pieces um, of 
many different sequences. The polymerization I showed you before gives you all kinds of different sequences. Now, those are selected because only the ones which have the right sequence actually have the power <laughs> to bind here. So the one could probably bind. <laughs> Sorry. And now it's waiting for the other side for, for the other strand to come. And here it comes, you know, others trying, but they go off again. And um, when they are binding, the interesting thing is that although we do have this in water, <laughs> remember that polymerization you saw before only works in dry conditions. Here it's liquid water. But because the sequence brings these strands, ah, sorry, small mishap here. Um, mm -hmm. Ah, come on, it doesn't want. So these sequences are together, you know, the, just the fact that it does double-stranded RNA and those are coming together with the right sequence, they come at very low local concentration, although you have water. And this sips around here for basically some days until it decides to actually come together. The interesting thing is now, if I have here the last base, if the last base is not complementary, I want to have a black base. For example, if by chance I do have a a white base, it doesn't really be able to make the match precisely. If you would have uh, be here directly, you see actually you get a small mismatch in here. So it is not binding very perfectly. So the last base, if the last base is not correct, the experimental finding, I uh, just go back to the slides, is actually that you are not getting replication product. So if the last base, you know, we are expecting here this uh, ligation experiment, if A is here correctly, you know, you have here the sequence AU. So here's the U and the A you have on the other side. Only if the two bases, last bases are actually correct, you get 100% yield. The interesting thing for this reaction, because it's kind of not very strongly chemically driven, is that you get very, very low yields for all the other bases. So it's not only that the base find itself, but also the last base is very strongly discriminated against. We do have one case where uh, if you have a G, which has a bit the tendency to bind on A, and you have a, uh, on the other hand, a C here, we do get 30% yield. So some sequence combinations are not as good, but for example, if you would think about a case where we would have only AU sequences, right? Um, that would mean you operate in this corner, you would get quite a good uh, yield of those sequences. So what that does mean, it means that actually, if you calculate it through, if we would replicate our sequence here by, for example, six random sequences here and here, and we do the calculation, what we have measured is the sensitivity on the last base, and we can calculate what's the probability that these strands are binding from a random mixture. Therefore, we can calculate what's the probability for these six bases to come together correctly? And what's the probability for these six bases to have one mismatch? Therefore, we can calculate per nucleotide, what's the fidelity? And we get, if we don't have two large pieces, because then it will bind anyway and, and uh, uh, make many mismatches because it sloppily will bind, uh, we will get quite a high fidelity, about 98%. So that's quite amazing because this means the reaction, while being very slow, is very precise. Um, and the yield per nucleotide is also still quite high. So we think this is a very good starting point to really look for RNA replication. It would mean that you would not replicate base by base as a protein is doing, but it would replicate by these short pieces, which you actually make in the dry state before. Um, okay. 
I focus now a lot into the into the chemistry of how we think RNA could be quite useful in in performing. Um, and happy to take questions on this later on. So please mark down yes. questions. Um, just to note, you know, the the much more complex and the metabolism is much more uh, difficult. Imidazole activation has a lower yield um, and needs to have all those metabolisms. It is, however, a little bit faster. So there's competition between the experimental approaches, and it's good to to see different uh, uh, possibilities. Okay, so to wrap it up, I, I want to you know show you a case for RNA, how you could make RNA and use it for a replication cycle. I've not yet talked anything on the other levels of the entropy where we talk about how do these strands separate? How do these molecules come together? So there is actually in our three phases of entropy, also the question, how do you enhance the chemical potential? Of course, the drying process I showed you is a, is a very good way to accumulate the molecules, but you might, as you wet it and have a wet dry cycle, also want to think about a mechanism by which the molecules don't diffuse away in all directions. Um, again, entropy at work by Brownian motion, but come together in one location. So I think it's quite important to keep those molecules interacting all together all the time and have a, a way to locally reduce entropy, actually enhancing the chemical potential. And I just want to make the mark that although people think that vesicles just do that naturally, they don't, right? I mean, if I make a vesicle, I always have the same amount of molecules on the outside as I have on the inside, unless I do have a very specific protein machinery, which pumps it into the inside. Coacervates are actually very similar, but that's a, a long discussion. You know, coacervates is a way to make a phase transition, keep things together, um, you know, but you do that because you consume binding energy, but the binding energy is actually something you want to have to make your reaction. So actually the chemical potential in coacervate is constant when you make the coacervate. So it's, I think not really helping, but uh, I'll have, I'll get a lot of heat by saying that. Um, the third phase of entropy is actually informational sequence. So we will get next time experiments where we talk about something where we have a random sequence. For example, it could be that polymerization process, there's no real preference, you get all the different sequences, and then by evolution you want to select out a very specific sequence. That is again reducing your entropy and the mechanisms of Darwinian evolution at work doing that are actually very interesting to study and uh, you will have the third phase of entropy. Uh, number one was um, activation and, and make an activated molecule, low entropy molecule. Second was to get things together at one place, higher concentration. And the third is that we want to talk about conformational uh, informational sequence uh, space. That's important because life is all about non-equilibrium. Keep yourself out of non-equilibrium and the easiest say to show you that is kind of an image like this, right? I mean, we are used to dying processes, death processes, where entropy rises and you just decompose your whole uh, initial state. So if you have an RNA world and you don't have an outside mechanism to keep it together, to keep it in low entropy state, this is what would happen. You will lose the sequence information, you'll lose the concentration, you'll you lose the activation of the molecules. And it will be important to figure out the system where this all can be kept together. So, um, and equilibrium at local scale, micrometer scale, nanometer scale is, you know, diffusion is super fast. I mean, you remember perhaps, or you, if you ever heard it, uh, if you have a protein in a bacteria, which is about one micrometer in size, this diffusion if you have all the molecules in here, they will diffuse to the whole length of the bacteria on the order of one millisecond. The diffusion is super fast, super aggressive at small scales. So equilibrium is haunting you. So 
if you have you know, an Eppendorf tube and there are molecules inside, lucky you, but those Eppendorf tubes, you don't get on early earth, right? You get porous rocks, it will diffuse everything around and you'll lose your concentration. Or if you, you know, have something which brings in together reaction A and the reaction B, you know, how do you get that pure reaction A and that pure reactant B? Because normally that's your first state, but that's how you typically run the reaction. You have two pipettes and, and bring it together. Or, you know, if you have a cellular compartment, you nicely made the molecules inside, you know, that will be leaky and the molecules will go out and you'll get equal distribution. You, you don't have that in an equilibrium. And um, again, very often you prepare that, but you're not giving the mechanism which is giving you that interesting, you know, cellular compartmentalization or, you know, that triphosphate initial state. It's nice if you have that and you can nicely have a look how the reaction proceeds, but you pr make it proceed from a, from a non-equilibrium state to equilibrium, although life actually operates the reverse. So uh, one has to think about how to, how to get things going. Um, you know, because very often these are assumed non-equilibria where you are actually uh, not in non-equilibrium. So what are modes of, you know, far from equilibrium, right? I mean, I mean, the humanity operated a lot on, on thermal gradients, right? I mean, this was the, the start of the industrial revolution. Um, you have hot here, steam coming in, cold here, you get work out. Um, yeah, well, the future will be this, uh, and they operate very well. Uh, so you have visible to infrared, you get electricity out. The question is really, what is those, what are the machineries where the early life form can operate? You know, where you replicate a sequence, you will always mutate it, and you actually select it to get out Darwin evolution. But, you know, which are the gradients? How do you drive it? And that's the funny thing to to think about how to make something in the lab operating on that, uh, on that thing. So you can think about accumulation by evaporation. You can have UV is a very strong selection pressure. It's actually quite interesting that RNA can withstand UV quite well compared to all the derivatives you can think of. Uh, you could think about desorption on the surface as a way to keep things. Um, you can think about convection, which makes a temperature oscillation, you know, could be temperature which separate your strands here on the left-hand side, but you could also have a wet-dry cycle over the day, salt cycling, you can have temperature cycling. Um, funny enough, a temperature difference gives you also a way to concentrate molecules, um, but you can also, also phase transitions, bring things together, condensation, droplets, um, but also shear flow. So a number of non-equilibrium physics, geophysics, things you have on early Earth which could drive your system. And that's something we will we will uh, uh, go giving example in the next lecture. So that's kind of my cliffhanger for ki <laughs> keeping you uh, to the next uh, uh, lecture. And I also want to stop a little bit earlier to have questions from you. So please think about questions and we can you know, recapitulate things. Um, so the the thing is uh, where we need to think about how polymerization operates. We talked a bit about it. Ligation can do it, how the activation recycling operates, but also what the physical non-equilibrium can give you. How can you get the strand separation? How we can maintain the accumulation? At best, have the longest molecule accumulate better, so evolution is driving towards longer things. How you can feeding feed the system? How you can remove the waste? Um, and in the, you know, we can discuss a number of, of ways how to do it. Um, uh, one of them is a, is a temperature difference. So you have a cold side and a warm side, and you have a convection flow, micrometer scale. We can also think about having a water interface where it constantly evaporates on the warm side while it condensates and makes 
uh, bubbles on the cold side, the bubbles fall down by surface tension and therefore have strong salt concentration differences and those are driving the separation of the strands and so on and so forth. So uh, on the last slide here is kind of to wrap everything up a bit and, and prepare you for next time, you know, as we go back um, in evolution, that's very well defined. We can fully understand that biologically it goes, you know, back bacteria, but then you have this ribosome, this beautiful molecule where this uh, tRNA, which is about 70 bases part where you have the genetic code down here and the amino acid up here, <laughs> which by the way, has to be prepared by proteins nowadays. It's unclear how that was done early on. So, but this machinery gives proteins and that's, you know, basically the, the back extrapolation part. One has to think about what machinery can give you that very complex sequence, especially for the ribosome. So we have to think about a machinery which does recycling, replication, strand separation, sequence selection. And uh, one way we do that is the air-water interface where things in a temperature gradient, so across here is a gradient. So you have a, a cold side and a warm side, and you have a convection flow inside, you have evaporation flow outside, and you actually can see that RNA is uh, replicating up here. Uh, we are can operate that with the two, three prime cyclic. So that yield is quite good. The problem is that this ligation reaction is really nice for running replication is on the slow side. Um, we hope that we can optimize it. Uh, we're not, we think uh, there are good ideas how to do that, probably involving actually proteins um, and how uh, you can make uh, this setting of a, for example, warm cold site. Why we think this is quite interesting is that uh, not only does such a setting be able to run the modern biochemistry, so you can run actually modern ribozymes in this setting. What is also interesting, if you give such a wet dry cycle, some um, lipids molecules, the lipids are accumulating here. And actually, while also the DNA accumulates here, forms vesicles. And that's quite interesting. So these are air bubbles. So this is air. You do have this temperature gradient in here. And uh, outside here, you have DNA and you have lipids, you know, the most basic forms. And what you see actually, if you, oops, uh, almost, sorry. I should have had one more slide at the big end. I need to reshare. <clears throat> Sorry, not yet. <laughs> Zoom has not the most intuitive interface. Um, if you see it, yes. Go forward. Um, and uh, we actually see that things are accumulating as expected. But what's actually funny, if we switch off the heating, you actually see these bubbles coming off, which are actually nicely filled vesicles. Uh, and they have about 30-fold higher concentration inside than outside. So this interface here is actually a vesicle forming machinery. So we come from a requirement where RNA replication operates, add some lipids and actually find a machinery which nicely produces uh, vesicles all the time. So with that, um, I'm at the end of the lecture um, and uh, hopefully you have a number of questions, but that's kind of the introduction for the basic underlying motivations how we want to approach the origin of life uh, in the lab experiments. And next time I'll show you examples. You know, how could you run this? How do things come together? Thanks very much for your attention and happy to take questions. I look at the chat, so please. Uh, Dita, and thank please... you very much for this extremely interesting lecture. So yeah, please 
Everybody ask now questions in and the chat. Please ask stupid questions. Look, I'm, I'm a physicist. Don't, don't, I don't know. Okay, while well, everybody is still thinking and writing their questions, uh, I probably can start with the questions which I had. Um, so first about this chicken egg problem. So it's you explained everything very clearly why RNA should be the main molecule, but I mean for the formation of uh, this RNA, it's very commonly considered that catalyst can assist the formation. And my question is whether uh, like uh, peptides or proteins could be those catalysts which uh, facilitate in any way the formation of uh, the RNA. So yeah. Any... I, yeah, I, I think there's a bit of pre, a, a, a bit of over complexification in the field. People think that if you have, you know, RNA, right, and you want to replicate it, and you add those other bases, right, the typical RNA world assumes that you have to have a very complex, you know, RNA machinery, very similar to the ribozyme, ribosome. Those are called ribozymes. They're you know, about 200 nucleotides, very complex machineries, very hard to imagine that they would spring into life uh, early on because the, the, you know, the four to the power of 200 is just enormous complexity. And in the lab, people can do that, but with very good engineering and good experiments, basically mimicking evolution. So that's why people always think this is RNA and RNA can help doing it RNA. That's why we have to start with that complexity. I would argue it's actually much more simple. You know, you ha you do have that single-stranded RNA, and all you need uh, to have is shorter two sp species of RNA. They have to have this, in our case, this cyclic activation group at the, and and all they do is they come together, right? And then the catalytic function of RNA is just double-stranded hybridization. You know. It forms the double strand, and the catalysis is built into the RNA that they bring these ends at very close proximity, and you have to wait for one or two days, and hopefully in the future a bit faster, and then we click together. That's all you need, and you actually make a network. So the next time we'll show you experiment, I'll show you experiments where you see how the random sequences make already very complex replication networks just by that combinatorics of what is binding there and how fast they bind and so on and so forth. So you, um, in a way, RNA needs RNA to replicate itself, but all you need is kind of shorter pieces uh, and not much more. You know, similar in a similar topic, you know, what Czech Shostak is doing with the imidazole activation, you know, he then adds single nucleotides here and it's the same story. Uh, here, the problem is that the salt requirements, the chemistry, make it very difficult for the strands to separate again, where this is, I think, but we'll have to show it, um, easily doable with this, what's called a ligation chain reaction. Okay, okay but do you need any, um, like, catalyst, uh, wood catalyst? Uh, well, the catalyst... Help or no, not? No. no? Interestingly enough, I mean, if you add a little bit of magnesium, you get 40% yield instead of 25% yield. You, you don't... You, you just need a little bit salt or a little bit high enough concentration to counter ions that these strands are sticking together. That's it. Okay. So the requirements are super minimal. Uh, freshwater environments are perfect. And, and those environments, you know, also make it very easy for the strands to separate again. You basically only have to wait that they spontaneously dissociate again. And that should be enough on the only the, the thing. So uh, I think, you know, these directions should go for very, very simple, robust way of getting replication going. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so I have a, also maybe another question. Uh, how can we really deal with the problem of addition of wrong molecule during the polymerization? Because when uh, we have already a replication, you nicely explain how this mechanism could be self-correcting, but uh, for initial like RNA formation. So if we have uh, addition of some wrong 
molecules to the end of the strain will it destroy everything. And yeah, so if you have, of course, clean environment, I can understand everything can polymerize nicely. But uh, if we have like a dirty natural environment with many other molecules present, uh, can they also attach? Uh, or what do you think in this? Um, okay, we have not yet for for this polymerization, right? To make these to make these random um, uh, strands here, um, we can't yet give you an idea whether that's a real crystalline state. Probably it's rather amorphous state. Um, and if we add dirt to it, you know, what would it actually do? I could imagine that if you add, you know, RNA molecules which have no base, right? Um, I think the base is quite crucial in that dry state to bring these molecules close together. And um, there's actually also evidence that the, the PK of these bases are a self-enhancing reaction. So I think if you don't have a similarly base molecule and the RNA molecule, you will the, the probability that some other molecule will attach to it will be low. Well, if it does, I actually don't care so much because in the next step where you replicate these things, this mechanism of this close proximity in water solution only works if the sequence is correct, actually also if the chirality is correct, um, and it's a very self-selective mechanism. You can will only replicate yourself if you have a common pool of the same RNA molecules. So the replication will you won't get goo of wrong replicates because the probability of that will only work if you have those rather homogeneous conditions which you know is not too difficult because you just need the same base at one location and for example temperature gradients is a great way because they accumulate these two three cyclics the best also these uh phosphates so so short long long story short um this mechanism of first making the polymer and then replicating it to it with a two or three cyclic, which is very weak in binding, is very selective and should purify uh, the system right away from the beginning, even in complex mixtures. But again, should be shown and let's see. Yeah. I don't know whether I answered the question, but. I don't know, he's gone. Get some problems with the computer. So I can I can go for the thank you for the class, Dr. Brown, although it wasn't covered. It's an associated topic. I'd like to hear your perspective on the assembly theory. I've read some of your works related to self-assembly as a bottom-up method of manufacturing. I'm curious about your view on nature, both for the potential creation of artificial cells and for com more complex challenges, artificial life. Um, you know, the thing to, to talk about assembly, I have to just try to go for a more open slide here um here the, the assembly would be um that we start with random sequences you know and then you can have a look how these random sequences come together and actually make a a network of different sequences which are you know uh, they make actually autocatalytic network but the autocatalytic reaction is the ligation reaction in here, and therefore assemble a, a pool network of sequences. Um, I don't know whether that's coming close to what you think about assembly theory, but you, you might uh, follow up with uh, uh, yeah, the other. Why is 5-3 favored over 2-3 for the helix structure of RNA? So you think 2-5, I think. five. It's 5-3 or 5-2, right? Uh, for the helix structure of RNA. Well, I mean, that's the detail of of um, of this um, of this polymerization reaction in the dry state. Uh, why exactly, you know, computer simulations might eventually show it and and figure it out. The experimental finding is that if you go for these low salt conditions that you get about 60, 40%. We hope that probably by adding amino acids, we can shift that a bit towards the better one. What is clear uh, is that if you have, um, I, I didn't tell you that too much. You know, if you have single stranded RNA, right? I told you that water can attack it and hydrolyze it, right? Break it open. 
the point is that if you have double-stranded RNA, same condition, the probability that you'll break it open is about a factor of 1,000, 100 to 1,000 lower for hydrolysis. So already that means that if you have double-stranded RNA, so if the sequences find themselves, you know, which is a prerequisite to do a replication, they can protect themselves against their own destruction. Well, if they destruct, right, I can recycle those again with, of course, two or three cyclic. But those are together, you have then a much lower probability. And this is only true if you have a three prime, five prime linkage, this number. This number is, I don't know exactly, 100, uh, about, uh, not five, a thousand, but 10 or two, if you have two prime, five prime. And we are doing these experiments if you do have two five prime linkages, already the single strand degrades faster, but the double strand is even more pronounced because the double stranded form is not shaping as well. So you will recycle the wrong linkage all the time so that material doesn't prepare itself for the ligation. <laughs> and then the ligation, if that has the wrong linkage, is also not ligating as, as fast. So you do have some inherent self selection making it and self-purifying it. And by the way, there's also a chirality effect in that, uh, that you get homochiral rather, at least for G uh, um, things. So, so it is, it is a non-equilibrium driving and self-purification system. I think it's possible because the two, three prime starting molecule is not really uh, forcing the chemistry, but rather only if it really is in the correct conformation, it does it and therefore can easily self um, Purify it. Um, entropy always drives the system from order to disorder. Does it mean that in order to have life, the universe should be an open system? Yes. It's a very simple second order of thermodynamics, right? Uh, I guess. So, for example, for a planet to be able to host life, it would mean that you, you need some dissipation open system, your temperature is one way you think about it, and then whatever follows from that, if you have some other openness of the system, flow systems are, have a bit the tendency to to create waste. I, temp, we like temperature because temperature is a non-equilibrium open system without creating waste, right? Because heat flow goes through everything without <laughs> clogging the system. Uh, but there might be other ways. But But that's the crucial thing. So you need to have uh, non-equilibrium systems on planets to be able to um, to reduce locally the entropy, to be able to to jumpstart uh, Darwinian evolution. You know, only and and you need to care life with these open systems, non-equilibrium systems for a long time until they develop those bacteria, which can then, you know, like spacecraft, go for other planets, you know, separate themselves from their non-equilibrium environment, swim around and get to another non-equilibrium environment and then restart. So, so the vesicles I showed you at the very end, I think is initially, you want to package your system up like spores. While it's packaged up, it's a dead system. It's, you know, you can't make that system go, but then you hope that you shuffle yourself to the next non-equilibrium temperature gradient bubble or whatever, and then you reopen and restart. But because you do that all the time to distribute yourself to other uh, scenarios, eventually the system will take that intermediate state and make that the living state and then have life on a cellular level. But um, it was just uh, something in between. Uh, yes, but I think that's the, that's the core of where we can go forward. That we have to do experiments which are non-equilibrium open systems. Um, and then uh, Serge asked for stating the question with the microphone. I don't know. If that's possible. While that's figured out, I can jump for. Okay, uh, yeah, I yes, switch on the microphone, so basically yes. I can uh, yeah. continue to read your uh, questions, if you prefer. Or oh. okay. So Himna is, uh, is asking: the biomolecules are mostly of carbons because carbon 
can have multiple bonds and more abundant multiple bond forming element after hydrogen in the universe. Can we also have biological molecules with uh, silicon sil 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 or other element mainly? I guess you can. Uh, that's if we have. Um, uh, there's no hard argument why why RNA sh should be the thing. We have the one life we know used carbon, and therefore you know it makes most sense to start with that with experiments, um, because also you know the analytical techniques is there and it's much more easy. You can do sequencing and all those things uh, to first analyze our life. But uh, you know once we master that and we get too bored in making life in the lab we could, we should go for something else because those all those many extraterrestrial planets might have found different solutions right and we should recreate also those in the lab sure oh yes uh, so thank you for this um yeah answer i also have one question uh, from my side regarding the um, copper catalytic reaction. Sometimes they are called as uh, beginning of natural selection and basically origin of life. What do you think about this? Is it really true, or do you have uh, like a different opinion? Say it again. So, so the the mutation catalytic auto catalytic reactions that can give uh, natural selection and then it could give uh, like push uh, to the origin of life finally yes look there this kaufman theories where you think you have autocatalytic networks and so on have been always argued that there might be small molecules proteins amino acids it's very simple things which are autocatalytic um those have never been shown experimentally uh, in, in any way. So I would rather argue the smallest molecule which can be autocatalytic is RNA, again, by the mechanism I tried to sketch, that it can form this double-stranded form and therefore autocatalytically uh, makes a network of those sequences. So so that's why we have to go for, for these ridiculously, well, comparably ridiculously simple but also complex molecule like a nucleotide to run these autocatalytic networks. And, and for sure, that's the autocatalytic, which is proximity by double-stranded formation, um, which is at the core of, of a replicative system, which then goes on to, to do a Darwinian in evolution. Um, but you don't have to talk about function early on. People always thought, think that there's a special function. Well, the only function is to bring these two ends together as close as possible and, and therefore be able to replicate itself. That's the function. And all the other functions like making the ribosome proteins and so on, those are then, you know, things we always know when evolution goes, it will find always more and more complex uh, settings, uh, you know, which needs no local non-equilibrium and so on and so forth. To, to make that go, but eventually uh, will will just uh, drive itself. Um, sounds it sounds good. that it talked about the local non-equilibrium. Haiyang <laughs> He uh, is asking, how about the whole universe? Could we apply the same physical law to the whole universe by treating it as one system? The problem is the following, that I can talk here about entropy, but please be aware, entropy is a local, is an equilibrium entity. So if I can use entropy here, I have to assume local equilibrium. Otherwise, the term entropy doesn't make sense. It's not defined. And we don't have a theory, a physical theory of non-equilibria. So, so anything about uh, non-equilibrium of the whole universe and, and, and uh, how's the rate of entropy production, and there's no theory. It simply is not. So we can't say anything. So, so all, all I'm saying is... Um, assuming local equilibrium, I can apply all what's known in, in uh, thermodynamics theory, but all your, what you're asking okay. for, you know, what's the rate of entropy reduction in the universe and how is that, you know, we can't say. We don't have a theory way to, to approach that. So the idea would be yes, perhaps, but we don't know. Thank you. Uh Possibly, yeah, 
one more question from my side um, regarding um, the lands of the molecules which are required for the autocatalytic reaction. So you said that uh, probably this uh, short uh, chains of RNA can uh, act for this purpose, but what should be the lens? So we can we can talk in the experiment. We uh, think shortly. The lowest we can go is six, six, and twelve. Uh -huh. okay. Very short, and basically, you know, those six mers, mm -hmm. we can create. I, I didn't show here. It comes next time, we can get from that drying process at concentrations of micromolar. Uh, if we start, sure enough, with with millimolar nucleotide concentrations, oh. but the yield is good enough that we get these pieces. So right now, it's actually not making the pieces, rather that the ligation is a bit on the slow side, and it's hard to motivate PhD students to <laughs> experiments over weeks. We do it in multi-well plates and so on, so we will get there, but but it's if the ligation would be factor two faster or three faster, it will, we would see everything. So I think we are very close to, to really um, get it going because we know that because a lot of times we did these experiments already by having the luxury of adding a protein, which does such a reaction typically in five seconds, okay? And therefore we do know how the system actually operates. But to really show it with a slow prebiotic version is a bit of a challenge on the time axis. But let's see. I think we are not yet at the optimum point. I think you know there will be different uh, conditions where things are faster. Okay, thank you. And uh, what do you actually think about uh, alternative um, chains of RNA? So it's not uh, like a classical RNA chains like it is now, but uh, there were some different ideas that uh, early RNA had uh, different uh, strands and uh, different uh, molecular arrangement. Um, do you believe in this? What's your opinion? We believe in the experiments. <laughs> <laughs> and the experiments tell us that, for example, if you take a GC, uh, we have to go for quite high pH, which is a bit difficult. And the G, you know, that that is not giving us a very homogeneous um, polymerization of G and C. We get a lot of poly G sequences and low C polymerization. So, so not many of the strands will actually form these double stranded forms because it's not really balanced. Uh, we see that AU uh, mixtures do it much better. Um, and it could actually be, and the people have argued for that, that, for example, the G base, although it is uh, important for the genetic code, but who knows, genetic code came later. So it could be that you talk here about inosine as another version, because inosine is also much easier to make prebiotically. And uh, we are probing those experiments too. So we, we fiddle around with a little bit different bases. I wouldn't fiddle around too much, the backbone, the other thing. I think that's, I would argue for that recycling is kind of a good configuration, but some other base, why not? Um, and it could be that, you know, my hope is a bit that this ligation might profit, for example, from using a little bit of different base setup um, in the first place. Um, there's also a, a strong argument experimentally, we'll see that next time that, uh, the four base configuration is probably not how things have started. Uh, things are much more, you know, sequence space much compact, reactions faster if you have two bases. So we rather think about two bases uh, to start evolution, and then it's also not a too complex requirement. You need two, two, three cyclic, perhaps a trimetaphosphate to do the recycling, and if those are good in doing the ligation, that system will. You know, outcompete all the others, and then it could be uh, later on it uh, involved G, although G was very hard to make, uh, and then G took over, and you know, it's it's not unusual because DNA has T instead of U, and uh, you know, there's also some other bases in the genetic code and tRNA molecules. So, you know, I think we'll, we'll be able to figure out experimentally which of the two bases would be the best to start. 
and then we will understand much more why then nature has selected the others and so on and so forth. So I'm open to exchange uh, bases. Uh, the backbone I would I would keep, you know, on other planets might be different, but you know, okay, I think okay, okay. we want to understand our life. Yeah. Okay, so you will speak about this uh, double uh, basis. Uh... And yeah, we we'll have, uh, you know, that was a PNS paper two years ago, uh, three years ago, where we actually explicitly seen that the four bases and we understand why they're not uh, performing as well as two bases. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, I see currently no further question from the audience. So, yeah. Let's thank you. Keep your all. question for next time. Yes, this is also a good point. Yeah, and thank you, Dita, again for this very informative lecture. And yes, and see you next time. Then yeah, yeah see you in two day. days. Yeah, yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.